Thank you for the lovely introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. This is really interesting. Um, you know, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and I know we all think, okay, there's acute myocardial infarction, there's other things, but actually, both heart failure and diabetes are debilitating diseases. Regardless if they have an interaction or do not have an interaction, this is what we're going to discuss because it's not so simple. And as discussed, we've seen this uh, today, I think that heart failure is very prevalent. It's present in one to 2% of the total population um, anywhere. Regardless of the gender, regardless of the race, heart failure is very prevalent and it's going to increase because diabetes is on the increase, hypertension is on the increase, better treatment of ischemic heart disease is on the increase, so patients survive more. Patients get older, so heart failure is going to increase. Regardless, this is the problem. Not only that, why are the cardiologists and diabetologists at a little bit of an interface? Because heart failure is the worst disease in cardiovascular medicine. It's not the acute myocardial infarction. The acute myocardial infarction, he goes or she goes to a primary PCI, she'll survive probably or not. But heart failure is a progressive degenerating disease. If you look at the lifespan, the patient's going worse and worse in symptoms with acute exacerbations and an increase in mortality, which is similar. The five-year mortality in heart failure is similar to most cancers. It's not so same. And the patient is miserable. The patient is always suffering. And this is why we're talking about that. Second of all, if you're interested in economics, the most expensive thing, not in cardiovascular medicine, in medicine is heart failure hospitalization. If you look at data even from randomized control trials, the total cost is mainly for hospitalization more than just the medications or anything that occurs. And hospitalization increases mortality. The more the patient is hospitalized, the less the survival. And this is another important thing. So when we talk about heart failure and we talk about endpoints in different trials, we're looking at symptomatology and improvement of symptomatology improves outcomes. Hospitalization, which is important for economic purposes and more importantly for mortality. And as any disease, improvement on mortality is something very important. So it's not so different with diabetes. Diabetes mellitus is a very aggressive disease and it increases both micro and macrovascular complications in the heart or not. But actually, diabetes is extremely prevalent in patients with heart failure, whether the reduced ejection fraction, and I know today in the morning there was a session by the Egyptian, uh, heart, uh, Egyptian Society of Cardiology, and HEFREF, which is an ejection fraction at 40 or less, actually diabetes is extremely prevalent there. If you see the different trials, it's up to 50%. Not only that, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is an ejection fraction above 50, also diabetes is quite prevalent. If you look at the data, it adds up to nearly 40% in the Paragon, the latest trial by Sacubitrol Balzart. But not that only. But heart failure is one of the most commonly uh, important associated complaints of a patient with diabetes it's even more prevalent sometimes than a myocardial infarction or a stroke. And heart failure is probably the most prevalent cardiovascular disease related hospitalization in a type two diabetic patient, more than myocardial infarction. Because these patients do not get hospitalized for a day or two, they probably for a few days or even a couple of weeks. So how does this interplay go? We have this terminology, diabetic cardiomyopathy which is actually diabetes relating to heart failure. It can occur by diabetes affecting the circulation of the coronaries, whether the macro or micro, causing ischemic heart disease and thus heart failure, simple. But there's a lot of other non-atherosclerotic mechanisms and this is quite important. It's not related only to the atherosclerosis, it's related to the autonomic uh, system, neurohormonal activation, cardiorenal activation, and this axis of the heart, diabetes, and the renal system is quite important and is a target to a lot of therapies right now. Also, diabetes has a direct effect or a direct toxic effect on the myocardium, which is important. So how prevalent is heart failure in diabetics? We've seen how prevalent diabetes is, heart failure. Well, actually, if you look at several data, we don't have you know huge data, 
but it can add up to more than 60% of patients, whether you're taking heart failure with reduced, heart failure with preserved, heart failure with mild reduced, there's a lot. So don't think that your patients with type 2 diabetes are immune. Actually, two thirds of them are going to have heart failure, even more. So please really take care of that. And in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, this is a little different. It's a lot of different mechanisms that are occurring, like the reactive oxygen species and the lipotoxicity and others and others that really cause the increase in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But another important thing about heart failure and diabetes is the treatment. We've seen in 2005 or six, I can't remember exactly, rosiglitazone, a great anti-diabetic medication, increased cardiovascular mortality. And other than after that, FDA mandated a cardiovascular outcome for all studies. What happened with the first one, with the saver? There was an increase in heart failure hospitalization. And thus, saxagliptin is not recommended for those with heart failure. And over the years, there's a lot of patients are being introduced and are being analyzed who have heart failure or are prone to heart failure in the different controlled randomized studies of the cardiovascular outcomes of anti-diabetics. And there was a postulation that good glycemic control reduces outcomes. It does, microvascular, not the big ones, but sometimes in the UK PDS it showed that. But overall, no, it doesn't. How about different medications? Maybe different medications can improve outcomes. We've seen the DPP-4, the GLP-1s, the TZDs, actually the TZDs actually increase heart failure. Even pioglitazone, which is an excellent medication to reduce atherosclerosis, it does increase heart failure. But it came to an unmet need, a medication called the sodium glucose co-transporter. And instead of talking about diabetes and increased incidence of heart failure, we're talking about an anti-diabetic which treats heart failure. How did this come along? Well, if you look at the mechanism of action, which is complex, but the parameters which SGLT2s work upon, they reduce hemoglobin A1C, which is good for any patient heart failure or not. It reduces blood pressure, which is one of the parameters of treatment of heart failure. It reduces the weight, which is another parameter that reduces outcomes in heart failure patients. And the results of the outcome studies, though different in MACE, though different in reduction in mortality, consistent in heart failure hospitalization reduction. There you go. A 30 to 35% in all cardiovascular outcome studies with SGLT2s to reduce the uh, heart failure hospitalization. So it is an extremely important thing to think about. How do they do it? Lots of questions, lots unanswered, some unanswered. It's not just the diuretics, it's definitely an effect on the myocardium. And we've seen data with empagliflozin right now that it improves the ejection fraction of the left ventricle, improves the size of the left ventricle. There's a lot talking about the neurohormonal activation, direct effect on the sodium hydrogen. There's a lot of theories. But do they work? This is another question. So we have the data that they reduce heart failure. And this data has been not only seen in the controlled randomized studies, not only in the patients who had established or had high risk factors, not only in those who had a previous history of heart failure or did not have heart failure. And this could be a sense that this medication will prevent heart failure later on. And also in the real world setting. So if you can see that we have definite outcomes, cardiovascular outcomes in type two diabetics, that these medications improve heart failure. Do these medications as part of the interplay between diabetes and cardiovascular disease, especially heart failure, does it have data? And this is what was important in 2019 in August, the last physical European Society of Cardiology meeting, this was the most watched, actually broadcast. It was DAPA heart failure. Adding uh, SGLT2, the 10 milligram DAPA glyphosate in patients with HFREF in those who are diabetic and non-diabetic. And you can see that there was a significant reduction, not in symptomatology, it was significant in symptomatology,
but in cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Whether it's the primary endpoint, secondary endpoint, the significance was there, even all cause mortality. A year later, again, one of the most anticipated in 2020 was virtual, the ESC, was empagliflozin's emperor reduced. Again, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and adding to diabetics or non diabetics an SGLT2 inhibitor. Again, a copy-paste of reduction in the primary endpoints of cardiovascular death over the composite of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization, mainly pushed by heart failure hospitalization. And again, this data was regardless of the presence of diabetes or non-diabetes in the emperor reduced or the DAPA heart failure with a high safety margin. This is very good. We've seen rosiglitazone control diabetes and cause a lot of problems, but here, we're talking about a medication which reduces death, heart failure, hospitalization, improves symptomatology without an increase in adverse events of significance. And since then, we were talking about the four pillars of heart failure, which include the RAS blockade, the beta blockers, the aldosterone antagonist, and the SGLT2s. Not only that, SGLT2s have invaded another part of heart failure, which is the heart failure and preserved. Actually, just last November, a year ago, there was data from sotagliflozin scored or soloists. And taking the subset of patients with heart failure and preserved normal ejection fraction above 50, actually they did much better. But it was last August, again, for the third year running, the most important or the most watched uh, randomized control study in the European Society of Cardiology Congress was an SGLT2 um, trial. It was emperor preserved with a significant reduction of the primary endpoint, mainly pushed by heart failure hospitalization, but the composite is heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death. So these medications are probably cardiorenal protective agents with some good, some less potent, because in non-diabetics they don't do that. They reduce the blood sugar. I know this slide is controversial. I know a lot of people might think which ones to start off with, metformin or SGLT2s in, uh, in high-risk diabetics. Um, all I know is the control of diabetes is very poor. We're probably going to take two. We're probably going to add to them. So it doesn't really matter. The ADA discussed this better and really did, uh, you know, um, phenotyping of the patients and thus in heart failure or CKD and SGLT2 is a class one indication which is very important. In our guidelines, in the cardiology guidelines in January, the American College of Cardiology recommended as a class one, the SGLT2 inhibitors, empagliflozin or dapagliflozin to be given to patients with HEFREF as part of their medical therapy regardless of their diabetic status. And this was reiterated just last August in the European Society of Cardiology meeting and thus the guidelines published show that these four pillars are class one indication. So what to take home? Heart failure is an incredible problem all over the world and diabetes too. Diabetes is on the rise, especially in our region. And diabetes and heart failure have an interaction with each other. First of all, it was diabetes leading to heart failure and a lot of heart failure patients having diabetes Actually, now we have progressed into anti-diabetic medications treating heart failure, which is important. They've done it in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. They've done it in heart failure with preserved. We're waiting, of course, for deliver, which is going to be out in a couple of months. But definitely, diabetes and heart failure do have this interaction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Shawi. Actually, <coughs> when uh, these drugs uh, started to be important drug in the cardiology patients. Uh, we, we were afraid of the hypoglycemia, but uh, I, I think the data and uh, the clinical experience showed that no problem at all with hypoglycemia, even in non-diabetic patients with heart failure treated by these drugs. And it in, uh, actually invade the, the cardiology uh, uh, field so that uh, I think most of heart failure patient now is on one or the other of these SGL2 inhibitors because uh, uh, many factors. First of all, the data presented by Professor Shawi about uh, the, the, uh, the importance of these drugs in heart failure, how, how they prevent hospitalization and event and mortality. Uh, 
And, and most importantly is that most of our patients in Egypt and in the Middle East even are pre-diabetics. Most of the acute heart syndrome patients, ischemic heart disease patients, are pre-diabetics, are metabolic syndrome, are obese. And actually, if we do glucose tolerance curve for most of these patients, you will find a lot of them. So uh, it becomes more and more one of the first drugs that one thinks about in, if, if you have a patient with heart failure and multiple risk factors. Uh, 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 I, I think, Professor Shaw, uh, we are not, we are, as cardiologists, uh, we are not treating diabetes. But we have to be indulged in, in diabetic management as the same as a diabetologist should be involved in the patients with multiple risk factors, ischemic heart disease, and heart failure. Uh, so, uh, should, should there be a team treating the diabetic patients, especially that even chronic kidney disease is, is, is another item of the problem. Patients with chronic kidney disease are uh, liable to myocardial infarctions. The, most of them die from heart disease. And whether they are diabetic or not, they may also take these diabetic drugs. So I think very good question and I will just put it like in heart failure we have the cardiologist in the center we have a diabetologist a nephrologist a neurologist a psychologist on the periphery which is important diabetes is treated by a diabetologist and we are at the periphery um, but the thing is we are trying to just you know reach out to our friends our colleagues in diabetes because a lot still do not understand what heart failure is, not to say they don't see the patients. We though are the ones who see the patients. You see a chronic ulcer, a heart failure patient is much worse. You see an acute myocardial infarction, a heart failure patient is much worse. So if there is a possibility that the patient can take something to reduce the possibility of heart failure, please do it. We don't like these patients because they are miserable. They live less, they live miserably, and their quality of life is quite poor. Thank you, Professor Shawi. Please join me. Thank you, Professor Shawi, for your elegant presentation. Now I have.